a lot of people requesting English, which is great for me. Uh, Dorian said, I speak perfectly both. I speak pretty well French. I can get by. Perfectly might be a stretch. So we'll do it in English. I see quite a people requesting English. For the questions, if you have questions, feel free to ask them during. I'll get to them at the end, unless I find a question really pertinent or really important to the subject I'm talking about. Feel free to ask your questions in French or in English. If it's something quick you need to write out, write it in French, I'll respond in English, that's not a problem. Uh, Dorian's already covered a few things about the microphones and cameras, so I won't, I won't repeat that. I'll just talk about the camera real quick and why I, I like to have, to see as much people as possible. I realize it's not possible for everyone, but we'll talk about this a little bit later. If you do webinars, if you do these types of situations, the question you ask is why? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this live? Why can't I just record this and send this to you afterwards? And one of the questions, one of the answers that comes is we're here to make a connection, the connection that's missing because we can't be in person with each other. So me being able to see you and your cameras allows me to do that because you can see me. It also gives me an idea if what I'm saying makes sense or if I see faces going like this, then I know that I'm not making sense and I need to repeat or change what I'm saying. I'll also ask for some interaction. As Dorian said, I won't have you dancing and waving your hands, but from time to time, I might ask for some interaction just to get an idea of some simple responses. Things like a thumbs up or a thumbs down, not more than that. You don't have to speak, you don't have to do uh, many, many things. Um, as Dorian mentioned, this is being recorded. I'll have some slides today, uh, and that is a possibility to send those at the end if that's, uh, if that's requested, but there is also a recording that you can come back to. And then, um, as I said earlier, we'll get to the questions at the end, but I'll use today a term, uh, Visio in general, but this applies to conference calls, to webinars, and I'd ask you just to take things with a grain of salt today. And what I mean by that is that everything is relative. Everything is contextual. So I might recommend something and you might say, well, in my situation that doesn't work and that's fine. Feel free to adapt with the question saying, how would that work in this situation? So we only have a, a limited amount of time today. So that's why I mentioned that it's, it's gonna be somewhat general, but I realize that a lot of situations are different and I'll do my best to adapt the content for that. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. And I'll start by sharing uh, my slides and talking over them. So what we're here to talk about today, and in general, is what I like to call high performance visio conferencing. And what that means is uh, before we did high performance conference calls, but today as things have changed, obviously the format of how we interact has changed. And so what we do today is uh, we're gonna talk about the language aspect, of course, how you can use English to be more comfortable, or if you're already comfortable in English, this applies as well. It's not just about language today, it's about good practices, best practices. So that's what we'll be going over. My hope is not to solve all your problems. I don't assume that I'll be able to do that. But my hope is that you come away today with some tips, some things you can use in your own practices. And then if you want to extend the conversation with me, we can do that later. So a little bit about what we'll talk uh, or cover. So I'll talk first about the digital shift, what has changed and what changes that we might already know or we don't know when talking from a distance or talking virtually. We'll talk about the audience experience, which is really important. Uh, we often forget that the audience is here and that's who we have to engage. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the speaker, but there should be some consideration on why is the audience there? What are they looking to get? What is their objective? We'll talk about the message. That'll be a, a kind of a bigger portion of today because the message is really important uh, if I'm doing a webinar, if I'm recording in advance, if I'm speaking in person, it's always the same thing. What message am I trying to get across? And this is much more difficult when it's not your native language, right? This becomes a problem because you don't have the same vocabulary, you don't have the same improvisation skills. I know this very well from doing things in French. So we'll talk about the message and that's something that's not just about doing it in your native language, it's foreign as well. 
And then we'll talk, I'll leave time at the end for questions. So to address questions, and if you have extra questions, um, and I'll talk about how to handle questions. We've seen a little bit already, it's very simple, but we'll talk a little bit about how to manage questions and interaction during a, a webinar, a conference call, or a Visio call. So if we think about today, um, obviously there's some things that change. We're at a distance, uh, but would you say, if I ask most people here, if you say, 80% of things change, thumbs up. 50% of things change uh, between an in-person meeting and a virtual meeting, or nothing changes. It's pretty much the same, it's just a screen. I'll just have you thumbs up if you think it's big change, medium change, no change, just to get an idea of where we're at. See a few mediums, big change, medium. I haven't seen anybody, no change, which is good. <laughs> so that might be the case. So there's quite a bit that changes. There's some things that stay the same. So I wanna talk about that first. What stays the same uh, on a webinar? What should stay the same? And this seems simple enough, uh, but a lot of people don't do this. They go in very comfortable with how they present. They go in very comfortable about the topic, what they're going to say. So preparation isn't needed. Uh, if you don't do this already, preparation on a webinar or at a distance is much more important. At a distance, when you animate, it's much more tiring. For those of you who have done this before, you know the concentration levels change. And it's the same thing for the people listening. Beyond that, there's a certain preparation of what you're going to say. Some people create an outline. One of the things I recommend, and that I think is really important, is what I call scripting. And scripting is writing out everything you're going to say. And this doesn't mean that you're going to repeat on this sheet. This is purely preparation. We do this with people that speak uh, in front of a public. We do this with people that speak from a distance. And the idea of scripting, why this is a really good tool to use, is as you write things out, you're creating arguments with yourself. So it's not a question of this is what I'm going to say. It's, ah, there might be a question here, so I need to prepare for that question. And as we know from a distance, the thing that's the most awkward is that, it's the silence, right? So if you're not prepared, and silence can be useful in webinars, you don't just wanna talk for 50 minutes nonstop, but if you don't prepare in advance, those awkward pauses, awkward silences could throw you off, can affect how your audience sees you. So scripting is more than just, here's what I'm gonna say, it's working through the process, getting comfortable with which word am I gonna say here? Uh, how am I gonna say this? What question might I get? from the audience at the end or during, depending how you do it. So scripting, you do this before, and then if you want, it provides you with a nice little outline during uh, your speech or during your webinar. And you can use that if you want, but the scripting, the word for word, that's purely preparation. And it's something we've used with companies, something we've used ourselves, and we've seen really great benefits from. The response I get or the criticism I get from this is, well, that takes time. Uh, that's a lot of time to invest, to script things out, and I just don't have the time. And I get that. Time is always a question in these types of situations. The question you have to ask yourself is it's, it's an opportunity cost. If by preparing and better forming what I'm going to say, I can get more clients, I can get one extra client, is that worth my time? It's a classic sales question, right? Is, yeah, I spend more time here, but if it brings another client, if it brings more business, then it's worth it. It's the same question you need to ask yourself. If you're thinking a webinar is, okay, I just need to dedicate an hour. Not necessarily. There's preparation, there's time after, there's a lot that goes with it. So consider that, ask yourself the honest question, what am I looking to get from this webinar? Am I ready to prepare, invest the time to prepare for this webinar? And scripting is one of those things, one of those tools to use. Um, there's a number of other things obviously that might stay the same or similar when we talk about style or the visual, right? For example, the audience, some people turn their cameras off, some people turn their cameras on, but you as the speaker, as the principal person, the visual is still there. What changes though, is all you see is this. I could back away to get a little bit more space, but in the end, you're limited to a box, if we're being honest. You're limited and so, all you see is here, you see the face, you see this. And so the impact 
of this area is much more than when you're in person. In person, we see the whole body. So visual style is still important. Uh, we've seen some people go into meetings with just t-shirts, not even thinking about it uh, with a client and forgetting that being formal or having the same approach, visual approach that you have in person is just as important visually, right? Could have worn a jacket today, but I felt that would be a bit more too formal for everyone here. So visual style is very important to think about. That might be obvious for some of you. For others, you might say, okay, yeah, I don't think about that that much. Um, then we move on to basically, one of the things that should stay the same is what is the message? And I give the example of Nike. The message digitally, and we're speaking from a virtual uh, barrier, sometimes has to be simpler. You have to think, what is the word What's the phrase, the key takeaway, the key idea I want people to leave with, right? And for that, the, sim the message has to be simple. And this goes with, well, if I can send you something by email, if I can send you my PowerPoint afterwards, and that says everything I want to say, what was the point of the webinar, right? It's to kind of get a connection, but also to transmit a message. And when we transmit messages live, it's much more powerful than if it's recorded or in another format. So something that stays the same, more or less, is the message, but it also changes in the sense we have to adapt it to make it more concise, make it a bit more visual as well, as we're seeing here today. Also, uh, things like eye contact. So you'll see me looking up at times, that's because I have my slides uh, with me. Uh, so eye contact is important. It's okay if you look away, because that's naturally what we do in person. But there's also the camera, sometimes to look at the camera to make your audience feel like you're engaged. And if you're one of the people that likes to look at yourself to make sure you're not doing anything crazy, you can just drag your video up below the camera, right? And that makes your eye contact close to your audience and helps make you look like you're looking at your audience. Um, so eye contact is still very important. This is something that stays the same uh, as well. And then also questions. We have questions. This, in a sense, is the same because you still have to deal with questions, but how we deal with it changes as well. So I put an asterisk on some of these things because they stay the same, but they're modified. So how we deal with questions is surprisingly similar. Obviously, the medium is different, but the way to management is much more controlled. And then the last thing I'll say is uh, body positioning or body language. Some stays the same, some changes. Body language up here, obviously, should be just as important as when you're in, in person, right? You can't see lower body, so you don't have to worry too much about that. But sometimes you can tell if I'm leaning, right? It can be distracting for some, for others, not so much. Another thing to think about, I seem, I don't know if, is anybody standing? Give me a thumbs up if you're standing. I think most people are sitting down. Yeah, I'm standing. I don't know if you could notice. But that's another way to kind of change, not just for yourself, but for your audience, uh, how you appear. And this is more for the animator. If you're animating a webinar, a video conference, if it's possible, I don't have any special tools. I've, my computer's on a stool. Uh, it's very much what I have at home. But the difference for the animator is huge. When you're standing and when you're sitting, much different. Standing, much more energy. It affects your voice, as we'll talk about a little bit later, the voice is greatly impacted by your body positioning. And when you sit down, you're closing off your airways, right? You're basically cutting yourself in two because you're folding at the, at the halfway point. And we tend to slouch. So I've seen this with, we've seen this with some of our clients sitting down, making a sales pitch. Over 30 minutes, naturally you get tired, you start to slouch, move forward, and your voice drops, energy drops. So something to think about, if possible, might not be possible, is can you stand? And if you can, it might have a huge impact on your confidence because you can move, you can change your energy a little bit. Uh, so really think about body positioning as well. So more or less, that's what stays the same. What changes? Well, quite a few things, obviously. One of the big ones I get is what we can wear. Some people can wear sandals now. That's the great part of it. Something that changes, we think, is again, the visual aspect of this. But more than that, there's obviously more important things that change. We have to think about the environment, right? So thinking about your background, 
how that's being viewed. We get comfortable because we say, well, everyone else has this or that in their background, so it's normal today. But it's still just as important to think about what's in this box. If this is all people are seeing, this visual is really important. In person, we have a lot more to work with. We have our hands, we have the space around us. So think about the back. Some of you have the, uh, the visual options that Zoom offers or other platforms offers, and that's great. Um, I've done something very simple, light background with some lighting, a plant, things like that. The idea is make the audience feel comfortable without distracting. That's the big goal, right? I keep it white around my head so it's not distracting and it's not taking away from me, but keeping it simple and making it easy for your audience to look at you. So environment is big. Considering your environment, uh, that's, a, that's a big change. What goes with that is lighting. So you don't see it here, but I have a lamp that's right facing on me to make sure you can see me and it's not one side dark, one side light. And I have a light behind me. You'll see if I turn it off, you might get some shadows. Here it's a bit better light, so not a huge difference. But you can see that lighting makes a difference, right? So consider your environment more than just what's behind you, but lighting. Sound obviously goes with this. We've probably all had the experience where sound has created problems. Um, and so we have to consider everything around our environment much more than we would in person. We talk about environment. We talk about the importance of communication. That also changes. You've probably, if you haven't seen this, some of you might have, the statistics of the importance of communication. Three aspects. You have visual, audio, and then you have the message, the words that you use. And psychologists have studied this and said the impact in general, these numbers change always, but in general, 60% is based on visual when we're face to face. What you remember, what you keep with you after a webinar, after a meeting, after a, a conference, 60% about is visual. That's the impact. 32% goes to the voice and then about 8% is the words. If you think of someone like Steve Jobs, for anybody who's watched uh, an iPhone conference or presentation, you might not remember specific words he says, right? But what do we remember? You might remember the turtleneck, how he looks, we remember the face. So the visual is really strong in person. What changes digitally, I'm now limited, you still have the visual, but there's this barrier, the invisible barrier, and it's not the same. So the impact drops visually eye tracking. We've done eye tracking with people. And so as we're distracted in front of our computers, looking at different things, the visual becomes less important. We're not always looking at the person anyways. So the 32% that's based on the voice, this shoots up. These basically change. Your voice becomes much more important, especially if we're speaking in a second language, we tend to be less confident. So a voice drops and we can hear that. Uh, we might speed up. We might stay monotone. And this affects our message, it affects everything. So what I want you to keep in mind, one of the big things about uh, what changes today and what's important to remember, just being in a second language, is the importance of your voice. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but I wanna get the idea through that. Yes, the message is important, yes, you see me, but the voice takes on a much, much bigger role in these types of situations. So just spoke about that. And then some things that, uh, something that people don't like too much is control. You have much less control in these situations. I can't control if I see you or not, if I hear you or not, I can't control what you're doing. In person, you can't control 100% either, but there's a lot less in this type of format. And if you don't expect that, if you don't expect that you can't control certain outcomes, well, when things happen, when mistakes or uh, audio problems happen, things like that, you'll be much less prepared and it will throw you off. It will destabilize you. So you have to accept that these situations, as much as you prepare, as much as you practice, you will not have full control over things. And for that, you just have to stick with a plan, adapt obviously as best you can, but don't let it throw you off. Don't let it destabilize you. That's one of the important things I see with people is they say, well, that's, that's it, or they stop. Uh, they're just so uncomfortable with the situation. Relax, breathe. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Can I get a thumbs up if my speed and my language is okay? If I need to slow down or pause a little, or if you don't understand me at all, thumbs down. Thumbs up, good, good. 
Just checking. Great. Okay. That, that's very reassuring for me. So do's and don'ts. Uh, some of these might be obvious to some of you. And if it is, then great. That means you're already doing something right. Uh, if not, then try to implement some of these things. Uh, the typical do's and don'ts, what we see. If someone's too close to the screen, you see me really well, but if I have any blemishes or any problems with my skin on that day, you might be more focused on that than anything else. So here I'm sharing my screen. You don't see me as close and that's fine. But if I was to deactivate really quick, and whether you have a grid view or not, I most likely come up and if I'm close to the screen, obviously it has an effect and especially with the sound as well. So that seems something simple, but I see all the time people forget and we tend to do this or opposite, we might be a little too far away from the camera. And then you have too much space around you, could be distracting. And it also has, I talked about earlier, this virtual wall, right? So you have this idea the farther you are, you're away, we already feel far away because it's, we're looking at a screen. So the farther you are away you are from your screen, the more distance I feel after a moment. So really important to find a comfortable space, a little, little bit of space here, a little space here, a little space here. But just to keep that in mind, don't be too close to the screen. Equally, don't be too far. Um, simple enough, but we forget when we start talking and start going with things. If I come back to uh, what else we need to consider, mute. Simple enough, again, uh, Dorian does this great. When you have a lot of people, you just set the precedent beforehand. You say, listen, I'm gonna cut your microphone. If there's questions, ask them, we'll get to them, uh, but let's keep them off for the moment. Simple enough, when you have smaller groups or when you're one-to-one, -one, we don't always think about this and it's not always interactive, but it's something to consider. Even if you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody and you're presenting a product, you're presenting your service, think about if I could just ask you to put your microphone on mute uh, just so you get the full experience and turn it positively, of course. Surroundings, we talked about this already, but just being careful of what the person can see and how they see you. Think to yourself, how, what would I think? How would I feel looking at myself? So it's kind of a hard exercise, but keep that in mind. What's around me? Is it distracting or is it complimentary? Um, focus. So what are you focusing on if you're looking at the screen or looking away? Uh, what are the other people focusing on in terms of your message? So the do's and the don'ts here is don't be focusing somewhere else or if you have a screen, try not to be looking down in a way. We're already distant as, an, as it is. So anything you can do, looking at the camera, looking at the people so it looks like you're engaged. We talked about looking at the screen. This goes the same idea as I just said. Speed, think about speed. I try to do my best to pause and to, to go at a comfortable pace without rushing through, even if you have a lot of content to cover. Nate, when it's your non-native language, this changes. Et au début, quand j'ai commencé de parler en français, uh, j'étais un petit peu trop rapide, ce qui veut dire je mange mes mots et là je, je commence à faire des problèmes et tu, com tu me comprends moins, je, je stresse, je fais des bêtises, so on and so on. So going too fast is only going to create problems, right? It stresses you out. Now you start to make mistakes. You start to misspeak when in fact you're a great speaker. But since you're speeding up, you're making it harder on yourself. This takes time to get comfortable with, to get comfortable with pauses and silences, especially on a screen because we can't hear, we can't interact as quickly. So speed is something really to consider. And you might be thinking to yourself, not a problem for me. One thing to do is record yourself, practice with somebody, get outside, uh, outside advice, outside insight or perspective. Because I guarantee you, your speed is much different in a digital uh, platform than it is in person. So be very careful with that. Inversely, you don't want to go too slow because then I'm boring you. Right. Movement. Hands is one thing. If I'm farther away, I could always keep my hands up here to stay animated, but then I might, I might look crazy. One of the things I try to do is raise my hands or use my hands a little bit to, again, bring you closer to this feeling that we're in person. Right. When you're in person, you can see more of me. If I don't have my hands, 
Imagine for 50 minutes, you're only seeing my lips move and only my head. This helps break things up a little bit visually. So if you're looking at me, if it's not just the screen you're looking at, the hands can make a big difference on this. This is simple enough, uh, but people still don't do it. Test ahead, make sure the microphone works, make sure the camera works, make sure your setting is clear and looks okay. I'll just mention that quickly, but it's always a good reminder. And then engagement, uh, do's and don'ts. I do a simple engagement when it's a lot of people like today, 30 or more people, uh, 60 or 70. You can do little things, thumbs up, sideways. You can do raise your hand types of things. What we found doesn't work so well is forcing people or treating it like a classroom. So if I was to go, uh, Florence, would you like to answer this question? Florence is probably thinking, oh gosh, do I really have to answer this? Is he actually gonna ask me something? Um, so you don't wanna put pressure on your audience. That's not why they're there. For you, you're thinking, well, I wanna make sure they're listening. But like I said, you have to accept, you're not gonna have control all the time, right? Accept that and the people who are listening and the people who are engaged, they're gonna be engaged. You can do what you can do to help, be, help them be engaged. So it could be hand movements, it might be back and forth questions. Engagement can be as simple as stopping a screen share to kind of break things up as well. So stopping coming back to me, a person to feel more connected or more engaged uh, and ask a different question. And then you go back, you go back to sharing the screen and, uh, and that helps kind of break up the feeling that you're distant still. And this is something that we get very uncomfortable with and it's easy to get disengaged. So engagement is tricky. And I'm not gonna lie and say that, oh, here's a, here's a magical solution that's gonna help because things are, are, are different. Since you can't control, you have to do what you can to engage. But if you go too far, you're going to create a negative impact, calling on people, making them feel like they have to work. It's not a classroom. And it depends on your context, of course. So I'll ask a question here, looking at this, uh, looking at this picture. If you would like to be the red apple, raise your finger. If you'd like to be the green apple, raise your hand. So red apple, green apple. So red, red, green apple. I see red, mostly red, but you see there's some people who want to be green. If we relate this to a message, uh, the message you want to give to your customer, and we imagine here's a, a number of different questions or a number of different messages we can transmit, we obviously want to be the red one to stand out. And most people want to be the red, but not everybody wants to be the red. So this relates back to what I'm talking about. Don't call on people, don't force people to be the red apple because you might be creating a negative uh, interaction with them. Beyond that, this picture is more about messages we transmit. And the message we transmit when we do these types of webinars, the whole point should be to transmit a message, to stand out. We wanna be the red apple, right? If we imagine the green are the competitors or people we're, we're kind of going against, we wanna be special, we wanna be the red apple. So how do we do that? Especially when we're not in person, we can't rely on improvisation with body language. So now I'm gonna talk about the message, what changes about the message. And here we're gonna talk a little bit about the content. So this goes beyond language, whether it's French or English. We'll talk a little bit about the English, what you need to change to feel more comfortable, what you need to be aware of to make it work better in English. Uh, but very simply, the mental approach, when you go into these situations, how do you see your audience? Are you just thinking, here's what I'm gonna present? Here's what I'm gonna give them? Are you thinking, what do they want? What are they expecting? One of the questions, to be quite honest, we talk about with Strictexio is what people who are participating today, what do they do? What are they looking for? What are their objectives? You're spending time here today, right? And when you work with people in a webinar or at a distance or any time, you have to ask yourself, they're giving up time. What are they getting in return? What am I giving them? And hopefully it's more than just uh, something I can download offline, more than I can uh, just find quickly on Google. So the idea is not to see a presentation as a presentation. Already that puts you at a distance, right? When we present something, it's me, me-based. The way to look at it is a conversation. This is a mental approach. I can't converse with everybody here, obviously. 
But the way you see this, if you see this as a conversation, and what we talked about earlier is if you have questions, ask questions and we'll get to them. You have to view this type of interaction as a conversation, a back and forth. I'm open to questions, I wanna respond and so on. The mental approach is big. You, you start to think of things as a presentation. You've already got the other person out of your mind. You distance yourself physically or mentally, and it has a big impact on your language, how you present your language. It becomes about them instead of about us. Mental approach is important. Conversation, it's about us, not about me giving you or you giving me something. It's about us working together. So this is obviously easier in person, but at a distance, we can still try to approach this the same way. Um, we think about a prep plan. We talked about this earlier, so I won't spend too much time on this. But preparation, what is your plan? Are you going in? Have you practiced before? Have you created a script? This is something to consider. And then questions, not what questions obviously you're going to ask. What questions might you get going into the situation? What are people going to ask you? That's a big one people miss out on, so they're surprised when they get certain questions, of course. Moving on from the mental approach, if we think about, um, if we think about the structure, how you structure your presentation or your conversation, as we'll call it, uh, there's different ways to do this. I'm going to give you one example that's really effective with investors or with partnership uh, meetings. And this is kind of the sandwich method, and startups do this a lot. You talk about, you come into a meeting, you talk about, here's the problem today. Uh, here's my solution of what I want to change or what I want to solve. And the solution is more about the future. So when I put solution, I should have put future, but here's what's going to change in the future. Here's how the future looks. Again, what changes is in person, I can rely on my body movements. I can rely on a lot more. Digitally, I can't do that. So I need to help create a visual. I need to help create a visual that will be as impactful as if I was presenting something in person. I don't have the product or the service. If the service is you, I, I'm not in person. So you have to help paint a picture of where you're going. So the problem today is that um, uh, transport has been shut down. We can't get things to, uh, from point A to point B. So here's our solution today. Here's what we're thinking. What does that mean for the future? Well, that means in the next year, in the next six months, we can do this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you're taking them from a very logical place, the past. Here's what's not working, why I'm talking to you today. Here's what we're proposing. Here's our idea. And guess what? Once we, we use our idea, this is what the future looks like, right? This is impactful in person, but becomes much more necessary at a distance. Again, the visual aspect has changed. So your voice and the message you transmit that importance goes up. So this is one way, but I, I want you to just to think about when people come away from these situations, what do you want them to walk away with? If it was one word or one sentence, is it high performance video, video conferencing? Is it, it uh, superb excellence in service? So on and so on. And if we think about that, um, you have to think from the audience perspective again, what are they getting from this? What are they here for? Are they here for engagement? Are they here just to get the slides? If that's the case, then, then okay. But try to provide them something extra, something they don't get with the slides. That's the point. Think about you, right? First, think about why I'm here, uh, who I am and what my expectations are. Put yourself in the audience place. So today you're in the audience place, obviously. What is it that you're here for today? Who am I? What, why am I in this webinar? What am I hoping to get? Then in your situation, flip it around. What is my client? Who, who are they? What are they hoping to get? Why are they here today? Again, this goes with preparation. It might seem simple, but not enough people do this. And then afterwards they go, oh, I missed this message or I missed that. So these are just basic reminders and I'm, I apologize if I'm repeating. Uh, we talk about voice. And here's really where the importance and the change comes in. I'm standing up because it helps me project, project my voice. When I sit down, it takes more energy to do the same thing. So the standing, yes, I'm standing and it takes energy to be on my legs, but the voice, the concentration when you're sitting down, you're making it much harder on yourself. Now it's not possible for everybody to stand up. I'm not saying it should be, 
But if you can, it's something to consider. It has a huge impact on your voice. There's different aspects of the voice. We talked about speed. One of the other things is intonation, and this is language-based. When we talk in French, uh, in general, it's not everybody, but in general, it's more of a monotone language. It's more, it's more poetic, so it flows on a straight line. English, we like to go up, we like to go down, uh, for better or for worse. It's very much more intonated, ups and downs, words that are stressed, sounds that are stressed. So usually I do this with small groups and I have people try this out, but I'll be the person to, to kind of do it differently. We imagine the phrase, I did not steal your car. How many different ways could you say this sentence by changing your voice, by changing the speed? Take a minute to look, think to yourself, how many times? And then I'll ask you in about 30 seconds here, how many you think. So, Hold up, if you can, on one hand, how many different ways can you say this sentence, or do you think? So I see three, how many else? Guesses, four, five, four, it's pretty much four, okay. So the very first one most people say is, I did not steal your car, right? I'm sure, so I emphasize not. Other way we could say it, I did not steal your car, right? Somebody else did, okay? I did not steal your car. I just borrowed it. Don't worry, I just borrowed it. I didn't steal it. Uh, so we can change that. I did not steal your car. It was somebody else's car, so don't be so upset. Or I did not steal your car. I stole your bike. So you still have your car, it's okay. Same sentence, we haven't changed the words. And this is what I was talking about. The message isn't as important as we think. It is but the voice can change a lot. The same words, same sentence, said different ways. There's other ways you can say this as well. You could say, I did not steal your car. Question, I did not steal your car. We go down, we're sure, right? So it's not just about the stress of the words. So I'm not making this example to stress you out and go, oh my gosh, I have to think about every word I'm saying and where to go up and where to go down. That's not what I'm saying. When you're doing your preparation and your scripting and your outline, it's really important to think about which words are important. What are the most important words in what I'm saying? What do I want my audience to remember? This is also known as rhetoric, repeating words. If you have the time, regardless of not if you, if you like the company, look up Steve Jobs' iPhone presentation in 2007, I think, uh, and you'll see really good examples of this where he repeats, it's really slow, the message is really simple. And he repeats, it's three things. He starts off by presenting, it's an internet communications device. It's a iPod with touch controls, and it's uh, a camera or something else. He repeats, he repeats, and then he surprises everyone by saying, oh, it's one thing, it's now a phone. I have all these things in a phone. But the impact of that, nothing special, simple words, simple idea, but I walk away thinking, wow, I get three things in one. So that's one example. But think to yourself, not how I'm going to stress every word or how I'm going to emphasize every word, but which words are important to me and where do I need to emphasize that? This will take time. It's not in one day, by the way, that this will become natural. But this is something I want you to think about and hopefully you can practice in the future. Body language we already talked about, so I'm just going to go through that. The thing with the hands, be careful with your face, eye contact, of course. So really, for the last five minutes here, because I want to leave some time for questions, for the last five minutes here, I want to go through what, what makes powerful messages. And I'll go through this kind of quickly, so if you have questions at the end, we can get to them. And if I can't get to your questions today, I apologize, we're limited, but feel free to contact me afterwards. So if we think about what make messages sticks, for each of us, we might associate an idea or a word with each of these people, right? So for Albert Einstein, somebody might say intelligent. Some other person might say E equals MC squared, right? For Steve Jobs, it might be a number of things. It might be their slogan, think different. It might be the iPhone. It might be the Apple logo. Each time, the visual, the visual reminder, the visual message is really strong. And then for Martin Luther King, might be an idea of freedom or the phrase, I have a dream. If you know who he is, that's a famous phrase and it's something that sticks with us. 
The rest of his speech was 45 minutes. How many people remember the rest of the speech and the rest of the words? But we remember that phrase and we remember what that phrase means. So that's what I mean. The, the words aren't as important as you think. The way you say it, I have a dream, he repeats, he repeats. So the voice has a big impact. And this is all live. So digitally, this is amplified. Your voice really has to have a bigger role and a bigger impact. So I just want you to think about this. In your preparation, you will need to take more time to think about this. The other parts that make messages stick that are really interesting, keep things simple. The simpler the message, the easier it is to remember. Just do it. Think different. There's tons of examples of this, but the simplest message is the most effective. Now, if you're in a sales situation and it's technical, obviously it's not as simple as saying that, we're gonna change the world and, and so on. But think about, you can still think about, how do I simplify my message? What is the goal of the goal? If I'm selling digital solutions, that's the solution. I'm selling, a, I'm selling Zoom, which, which is a uh, video conferencing application. Those words aren't interesting. I sell Zoom. Zoom is a way to connect with people, to allow people who are constrained by their individual problems or by collective problems to connect and to share. You see this all the time, this kind of language in marketing. The reason why is because it works. Keep things simple. Think about what is the goal of the goal. So here's my solution, but my solution will change your life in this way, right? A phone is a phone. I can talk about the parts in it, but the phone changes. It changes me, it changes how I connect with people. It changes that I can now know things in a couple of seconds. That's the goal of the goal, right? So keep things simple. This one, people always give me the confused look. And I saw initially, yep, a couple confused looks, a couple of smiles. The idea here is if you can give a message in an unexpected way, this also has an impact. And you see this in marketing as well. Car companies try to do this where for 30 seconds, they talk about family. They show you uh, a barbecue or a party. And then at the end, they show you the car for two seconds, right? Because they're not selling a car, they're selling a lifestyle. They're trying to surprise you, right? Change your expectations. So if you can do something unexpected, then that's always a plus, obviously. Uh, the wall, the idea of being concrete is the message I'm trying to do here. But think about something you can touch. When I say concrete, it's visual. I talked earlier about creating this idea of what does the future look like, right? I want to sell you a travel package uh, for $15,000. That doesn't sound very interesting. If I say, I want you to imagine yourself on the beaches of Bermuda, relaxing, white sand, the sound of the ocean crashing over, all your problems washed away. Uh, I want you to relax. That's what I want to sell you. It's a very simple example, but the point is I'm creating a visual for you that you're now attaching yourself to, putting yourself in that situation. It's an old sales tactic but it's very powerful, very effective. So your message, again, this is amplified when we're at a distance, you have to help create this visual, visual for your audience. The keys, this represents, if I had more time, I'd do the full thing, but uh, this talks about credibility or trust. How can I trust what you're saying? How do I know what you're saying is, uh, is right or even has any credibility? And so the idea is if you give keys to somebody to your house, hopefully it's because you trust them, right? You have a good feeling about them. And it should be the same when you're presenting, how do you create trust? Is it on a slide putting up, um, here's what I've done with past clients? It could be that simple. Is it a partnership working with people uh, who trust other people? Uh, and that way they trust me, they know I'm credible because this person says I am. So it might be by association so the message needs to be credible. For example, if, um, uh, if everyone's French here, if everyone knows Tony Parker, the basketball player, if he starts to tell you the best way to play, um, let's say football, you might say, okay, he knows something, but you would trust him more if he was talking about basketball. You would trust a football player to talk about football. And the point is, how do you establish credibility with your message? It could be as simple as, I've worked for 15 years in the field of communication. I've been doing 15 years of public speaking, and for the past eight years, we've been helping companies transmit their communication and transmit messages effectively. 
uh, over a wide audience. We've worked with companies like Coca-Cola and Sony. That's another way to establish credibility really quick, name dropping, it's called, saying here's who we worked with, if it's possible, establishes very quick credibility. And you see that all the time, that's a, that's a simple one to do. So messages more credible, more powerful when we can trust the person. And then the last part I'll talk about is emotion. I don't mean to make the people cry or to make them laugh. If you can, that's great. Uh, but attaching emotion to the person when they walk away, and this is harder again at a distance, we have this invisible wall. So if you can help create emotion in the sense, what's the link? What do we have in common? For me at the beginning, it might be, you're not a native English speaker. I'm not a native French speaker. I know exactly how you feel. I've struggled in the same ways, that stress or that nervousness or the questions after a meeting, did I say this right? Did I miss this? Uh, and so on. That might be a simple way of creating a link and sharing emotion. So this is best done when it's positive, right? A positive experience. The reality is a lot of people do this with fear or fear-based. Uh, companies will say, you don't wanna miss out. You don't wanna be out of this group, be a part of our group, so buy our product. That's, a, that's an example of when I talk about emotion, it's what are you feeling when you buy a service, when you buy a product? What is your audience feeling in these situations as they're listening to you talk, as they're seeing what you're presenting? What emotions are they going through? And hopefully one of those is not boredom, but it might be a reality. And hopefully that's not the case today, but again, it could be a reality. So I'll stop with, with that. I, I ended on the elevator for, for another point, which is uh, all this relates to what we talk about, the elevator pitch. And the elevator pitch, which is your quick 30 second to a minute pitch about your product or service. At a distance, this takes a, a big impact, obviously, and you have to do it quick and you have to do it powerful. So I'll just end uh, with mine really quick to give you an idea, because I didn't present myself in the beginning. So my name is Sven. I'm originally from California, and I've been in Europe for the past eight years. And for the past 15 years, I've been perfecting skills in uh, public speaking and English. And while I haven't gotten to 100% yet, I'm hoping to get there soon. What I do is I help companies communicate effectively across cultures and across languages. And that's what I'm here to do with you today. So you might think, yeah, that's okay. You might have a hundred different elevator pitches. And this is my general one because in another situation, I might know the person and I might tailor it to their situation. But always to think about, important to think about what is your general elevator pitch? 30 seconds gets across who I am, credibility, if it's years of experience, if it's who I've worked with and why you're here today. Again, creating that link or emotion. I'm here to help you communicate effectively in English might be a way. So I'll stop there and we'll take a look at some questions. I, I realize I ran maybe a little long, um, but if you do have some questions, feel free to enter them into the text box and I will uh, do my best to respond. And I'll stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes if, you've, if you do have questions, but if you do have to go, completely understand and feel free to do so. Um, I'll ask now, Dorian, if you wanted to say anything or add anything, Stephanie, as I see if, if questions start to arrive. Uh, 